All right. We are heading into the final installation of our conference. I am the Calvary Track 2023 B-Sides LV. We don't know everything that is going to happen in the next two hours, but it will be very exciting. So I would like the honor of presenting to you Mr. Josh Corman and Mr. Bo Woods, who have been on this adventure uh, for the last 10 years and counting. And um, we're going to have a little free-flowing workshop experience that is going to cover a number of different topics. I encourage you to stay engaged, keep an open mind, ask questions, be inquisitive if you need to, question the assertion politely, um, and we'll have, we'll have a good dialogue. Over to you. Okay, we may have a special altruistic lubricant. Um, <laughs> on its way. Um, so a couple years ago, Spam and may, Mr. Glass and maybe somebody, maybe Banshee, somebody found that there is a, a cavalry bourbon. Oh, Audie found it. But it was not in our part of the country. Mr. Glass so Mr. Glass delivered it. So we had Open. cavalry bourbon. It was okay. I couldn't find cavalry bourbon this time, so I have horse soldier. Never had it. it. Costs a lot more than cavalry bourbon. But we'd like you to partake if you're so inclined. Um, so people can, at any time they want, come up and take a little pour. Uh, not shots, this is a sipping bourbon, but, uh, and this is my first taste right now. I'll wait for both. Um, we called this session a hacker's guide to changing the world, parentheses, and where do we go from here? Um, oh, here we go. Here we go. Sipping, not shooting. It's changing the world. Changing the world. Changing the world. Mmm. Tasting notes. Mm -hmm. um, Vanilla, so, old oak, mm. saddle leather. Mm. I know what you're doing. Okay. So um, there's not going to be a lot of slides, but the, there'll be a couple maybe visuals in oh, some particular order. But um, welcome. Thank you for sticking this out. Um, we turned 10 years old on Tuesday of last week. And since I had never met this crazy guy before, that means my friendship bromance started with this guy 10 years ago, last Tuesday. So a decade's a long time. And I think we felt every mile of that journey, <laughs> and then some. Uh, and maybe we'll, do, we'll reflect on some of those things, but um, we had joked throughout this crazy journey involving a cast of thousands, um, Everyone chooses their own level of involvement. Uh, some uh, helped on a project one day. Some people advocated with a sticker. Some people dedicated three to five years of their life. Bo and Jen, 10 years of their life to this. Um, so we've had varying levels of participation, but um, hopefully if you've seen any of the content, like the keynote yesterday or any of the, what happened in this room, um, we did things we did not think were possible. But one of the refrains that we used a lot is, we have no idea what we're doing, but it seems to be working. And we joked that if there was a book, that would be the, the, the at least the working title. And of course, you know, 10 years later, we have a pretty damn good idea of what we're doing. Um, doesn't mean we've figured it all out and there's one path to success, but we tried a lot of things. And when Nick Bercoco and I were launching, we said, we're gonna be like hackers and fuzz the chain of influence. We're gonna try a lot of things, we're gonna iterate, we're not gonna take 10 years to fail. We're gonna try, you know, do things in parallel. Um, so whether you like the idea of fuzzing the chain of influence or trial and error or radical experimentation, I think the phrase we used on the slide was un radically uncomfortable ex experimentation. Um, some of the core principles that show that 
that really came through, we wanted to at least name them for you. There's a reason for that, because on the half where we shift, I don't know if it'll be exactly half, but when we shift to where do we go from here, I've been trying to answer since January. Okay, it's been a decade. Uh, do we end it? Uh, we should be very proud of what we've done. Uh, do we transform it? There were things missing in the world 10 years ago. The world's different now. What's missing now? Uh, do we combine it with other initiatives to get to critical mass uh, and have you know more wood behind fewer arrows? And I've struggled to answer that question. I have some very damn good answers, but it didn't feel right to answer them without the community that helped build mission, vision, goals for the last 10 years. And new people. I didn't even know this guy. So I couldn't bank on Bo Woods doing the tireless work he's done. And I, I might have other people reveal uh, their contributions for the next 10 years. So uh, part of this is naming some of the difference makers. Uh, if you could imagine, what if we made a boot camp for changing the world? What if we made a incubator accelerator for 20 new cavalries? We've mentored incredible groups like the Light Collective. Uh, Andrea is going to be at DEF CON several times, actually. We're going to be on the Do No Harm panel. She's in the Privacy Village. Uh, not the Privacy Village, the Disinformation Village. Um, she came to us what, six years ago and said, can the cavalry pick up this issue? Facebook's you know, violating privacy of patient advocacy groups. Um, and I said, well, we're really a safety organization, but I love what you're doing. I'll help you, but I don't think it's a cavalry thing. But And she's now got you know, an incredibly large and growing nonprofit initiative uh, for pre-cancer survivors and other patient advocacy groups to have trusted, safe conversations. Uh, they've elicited the support of um, um, uh, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and others. And we're like, maybe the path forward to scale the cavalry isn't just 10 more years of trying these things, but maybe um, parallel uh, world-changing events. And that means that a lot of the work we did didn't work. And just like we can point out what did work, maybe we can save others time on things that may not be as fruitful. So this is not the definitive, you know, we have uh, some confidence in some methods, but we're not so arrogant as to think that these are the way, they might even be wildly inferior ways. But I think even the last two days, we've heard some significant reinforcement from the, the British are coming panel from Suzanne just now about at least what our teammates thought worked. So you'll hear a few of those, but we want this to be somewhat interactive. Bo, do you have anything before we start? You know what really doesn't work? Doing nothing. Correct. Uh, or shouting into the echo chamber, or you know, some of the things that um, I had done before getting involved in uh, trying some of the things that did work, the radical, radically uncomfortable experimentation. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, from where I was then, I was just frustrated and wanted to, uh, was open to trying new things, um, because I knew that what, uh, what I was frustrated with could be changeable. I think that there are things now that are changeable by taking the right approach, by getting the right people together, um, by... Uh, being able to convince the right people of something who are in a position to cha make change. Uh, and I think that today, as opposed to 10 years ago, the world's a lot more ready for us to step up and, and do something together. Uh, I'm doing a lot, of, some of this by feel, um, but a couple years ago, um, Bob Dylan's son, Jesse Dylan, uh, met us through, I think it was the Congressional Task Force report he was at a healthcare conference and he cares a ton about health, has done a lot with Scripps Institute and different cancer research centers. And he offered to make us a video, a really high production video. So I haven't watched it in a while, but it's gonna take us less than three minutes. So here is the product of what we looked like, I think six years ago, I think it was year four. <laughs> Probably. Okay, so here we go. For security, oops, all this soft, I shaved my head for cancer research. Please excuse my appearance. Cybersecurity. All this software and connectivity that's defining modern culture is a pretty concerning thing. When you add software to something, you make it hackable. And when you connect it to other things, you make it exposed. Vehicles, 
medical devices, hospitals, high-speed rail, aviation, power plants. Our dependence on connected technology has grown faster than our ability to secure it, particularly in areas affecting national security, human life and public safety, global GDP and the economy. These are not merely theoretical. We've actually now seen some types of cyber attacks that have had profound impact. WannaCry and Petra and what we've recently seen with the ransomware, it compromised an entire ecosystem. I had thought naively that if I can get as high and deep as I could to the decision makers in government, that they would just fix our problems. The cavalry isn't coming. I'm the cavalry is a grassroots volunteer organization. We brought together hackers and regulators and device makers, industry and government towards the outcome of policy reform or smarter engineering choices before you have high consequence failures. If you just say you're a hacker, it resonates deep inside people as a negative. If you say you're an information security researcher, it's a bit different. Either way, you're doing the same work. I think there are more hackers out there intending to do good and to help. We share information a lot. We share techniques a lot. Our focus is on things that are going to impact human life, public safety. Our heaviest focus has been healthcare, followed by connected vehicles. But we have projects on maritime hacking. You can spoof GPS and divert ships into piracy shipping lanes. There's positive train control vulnerability. We're also looking at tractors, which could affect the global food supply. It involves both a reactive and proactive approach. The reactive approach is making sure your infrastructure is as secure as it can be. The proactive approach is doing threat hunting. We had a lot of medical device hackers, and one's a diabetic, and he hacked his own insulin pump. He found he could give a lethal dose of insulin without authentication. The manufacturer went public with the research to make sure that people were aware that there was security vulnerabilities in that device and how they could protect themselves against it. This is not going to be two hackers in a basement trying to change the world. This is going to be a community effort. Working with I Am The Cavalry helps bring that cohesiveness to the ecosystem which hadn't been there in the past. It's not just a U.S. thing anymore. There's people that live in Europe, in Asia, in Latin America. It holds the most promise working among those different stakeholder groups to be safer sooner together. I haven't seen that in a while. We look different. A little bit. Okay, um, thank you for, for that. Um, couple foundational concepts. I'm not, I'm gonna spend like maybe one minute on one of these and maybe 10 minutes on another one of these, but at least for what was advertised, and this is not the definitive list here. Um, I can't believe it worked. Doing this once a day helped me sink from okay. 205 to 126. <laughs> I, I, I too can't, can't believe it worked. Now you've got 35 tabs open. Okay, here we go. That's gone. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, here, we'll just do uh, empathy, uh, some sort of thematic image here. I should have used uh, one of your generative AI things. Um, part of what, and I'm not going to rehash everything um, from yesterday, but part of the idea to do this is I was emotionally shattered from the loss of my mom and the grieving process and I felt broken. And I didn't think I could keep working in security because I just felt like I wasn't going to be the same. I couldn't go back to seeing things or feeling things and part of that's just the grief process. But what I thought was a weakness to be healed, I started to realize as I came out of that haze, I likened it to being hit like as a boxer, just getting your clock, wrong, you know, bell rung. Sight was blurry and sound was blurry, but slowly your senses come back to you. And as I was coming out of it, I realized, wait, this is not a weakness to be healed. Like, I'm having the most authentic conversations of my entire life right now. Like, when you drop the fear or the pretense or the imposter syndrome, you're just talking to someone as a real human. Like, no one's a villain in their own story. Everybody's got a partial truth, but very few people, if any, will have the complete truth. And I think generally, if you can find common cause, common purpose, figure out what someone wants, needs, and fears, meet them where they are, not where you want them to be, but meet them where they are, then you can try to close the gap or you can elevate. You're going to learn something from them that you didn't know. They're going to learn something from you didn't know. 
And if there's enough compatibility there and common ground, I think hackers often look for what's wrong in something. We're really good at it. It's one of our core competencies. It's a gift. But I wanted us to try. Let's look for what's right in it. Little tiny spark, a little ember you can foster into a flame, into a roaring fire, into a, a forest fire, right? Like you can, you can find a tiny piece of good and you can make it better. And hearing the testimonies from some of our collaborators from the UK this morning, from Suzanne and her amazing team at FDA, she used the word empathy. Like we just listened to each other bi-directionally. We tried to find common ground. So I said, let's, uh, let's be a helping hand instead of a pointing finger. And I think empathy was our core first principle. And a lot of things subordinated to that. Um, before I say, we just don't super anything. Your empathy is good. Empathy is good. Um, but, you know, like a lot of uh, technical people, uh, it uh, took some time for me to develop that, to practice it. Uh, it's not something you just turn on overnight. Um, it can be learned, it can be practiced, uh, and it can have a, a transformative way or a transformative effect on how you go about um, collaborating, working with people, uh, kind of getting the best out of them, yourself, and anything you throw yourself into. Uh, on our first birthday here, we had a double PhD psychology person that Andrew Matuishan introduced us to, and her body of work was on X altruism, the letter X, extreme altruism. And she did a study in how this category she named had like six of the same eight markers as a sociopath does. Um, and the key differences where they differed were um, one has zero empathy and one had extreme empathy, could feel the pain of the world. So I, I resemble the latter. Um, but also uh, because that empathy can burn you out, they had a Wolverine-like healing capacity and or um, support network that would heal them if they exhausted and depleted themselves. We talk about introverts and extroverts. Like, you'd be shocked to know that Bo is not an extrovert, though he is so prolific and profound. So, it, you know, it takes time to recharge those batteries. So, um, but also I worked, we, at one point early on, we went, we worked with a woman who's, who works with profoundly gifted and talented children. And there's quite a few profoundly gifted and talented people in this room, in this community. We're drawn to it. We're two, one or two standard deviations from the norm. But a, a byproduct of profoundly gifted and talented people is they never really develop empathy. And she likened it to a muscle. So we can be empathy weaklings, but you can go to the empathy gym and build that muscle. And I'm not gonna recreate the entire workshop, but if this resonates with you, uh, she said essentially children learn empathy by mirroring their peers and being mirrored by their peers. But if you're special, gifted, different, neurodivergent, you don't have peers. So just from an early start, we just never develop that muscle. But when you do, when you try, I think we called the workshop excavating empathy oh, is this a superpower, right? And I think social engineers can fake it, and we have a lot of great social engineers, but I think it's been the difference maker. So I'm not gonna do a lesson on empathy other than thumbnailing that this has been, every success we've had has started in some way with leveraging our empathy muscles. Okay. I remember this can be interactive, and there's bourbon that has a horse soldier on it. All right. And we do want some story time from you guys. Okay. All right. Second building block in no particular order. Um, I forgot about this until I was looking at some early notes. Has anyone read Stone Soup? Does anybody want to summarize what Stone, Stone Soup was about? Cheers. Oh, here we go. Who's gonna do it? It's a participation sport. No, no, you? I will. Good. Once upon a time, oh. a person was traveling. He came, he or she came, we'll make it a sheep. 
she came into a town. She was hungry. And she approached a villager and said, you know what? I have a fantastic idea for dinner. All we need is one thing, villager person. All we need is carrots. I'm making this fabulous soup. All we need from you, villager person, is carrots. So the villager person said, oh, I can help you. They ran off and fetched some carrots. Then she went to another villager and said, this soup is just about perfect. Oh, it is, it's going to be really good. All I need, one potato. Just one potato, and the soup is perfection. Goes to the next person. You know what? This vegetable soup is super good. All I need is a, a, a rack of lamb, and it will be perfect. And on it goes. So the traveler with nothing, working with the villagers, came up with this delightful feast that they all enjoyed. Okay. So what I don't like about stone soup is there's a little bit of deceit in here, uh, but the person has a cauldron and a stone, and the stone water wouldn't have been very delicious. So there's a little bit of leaning into this, but the vision that we can have a delicious soup and I'm going to help make a delicious soup, created individual ingredients that would be really boring on their own. And by the time they were done, they had a delicious soup. Um, and I think part of what we have come to appreciate, whether you like the Avengers, right? Earth's Mightiest Heroes brought together for complementary skills to fight the, the fights that we can't fight and win on our own. Whether you like the idea that it took many ingredients and many contributions, some of them more substantive than others, but we described an end state that was attractive and delicious. And we made people salivate for it and hunger for it. And we manifested it through many small contributions. Uh, some of our biggest contributors did one and only one thing, but it was a vital one and only one thing. So um, I know it's a children's story, but I can't shake that there's something in here that was part of the success. I just want to ask a question. Uh, Is it on? on the mic? Hi, Russ. Question. Um, how, I, I imagine some people who you approached who you would have liked to have part of the cavalry or some support instead of responding to the stone soup ethos positively, looked at it with scorn and derision and, you know, this is the weakest of all weak sauces and you're coming to me with this. How could you possibly? Mm -hmm. And were you born yesterday? And how stupid can you be? And so I wonder if you could tell some stories about how you encountered people like that, how you navigated with them, around them? Did you convert any of them? Um, because I think a lot of us who would want to go on this path or think about paths like this, in random conversations, you're going to feel like instead of having something that can manifest to great things, is nothing but, uh, you know, soaked wonder bread and got nothing to it. Um. Yeah, I mean, especially when I and the cavalry first started, we had a lot of people who were like, yeah, this, this isn't a big deal, or I've tried it before, you're going to fail, or uh, the only thing that you're going to get is, um, you know, you're going to have to do a lot of lobbying and take millions of dollars, and um, uh, or people who you know, outright mocked us. Mm -hmm. I remember all the Twitter memes. That was not fun. We are the artillery. <coughs> yes, that was one. Yeah. Uh, somebody confessed that they owned that one yeah. to me. Yeah. Um, and apologized. And apologized. Yeah. 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 So, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, in a lot of cases, uh, they're, they were right in the way that they were thinking about it. Um, some, a lot of people had tried this. I mean, if you remember uh, the Loft Supper, the, the congressional testimony in 1998, where the Loft went to the Senate 
um, and you know weren't saying anything that most people in this room would not have known at the time. Um, so a lot of people did try, but you know the timing maybe wasn't right, mm -hmm. or maybe the people who were in those positions at that time weren't open to listening, or you know so uh, maybe it was worth trying again, or uh, you know the mental model that they had for what it takes to actually get access to a congressional staffer to go talk to them was that you had to be a lobbyist to get time with the the senator themselves or the member of Congress themselves, which might be the case. But it turns out a lot of congressional staffers are also very awesome and they do a lot of the um, research and authoring work that uh, goes into their boss's briefing packets. And they're the front line, they're the ones who take those meetings. And like literally I've had several conversations with staffers where like they didn't know me they kind of had to take the meeting because like that's what they do. And for like the first five or six minutes of the, the conversation, they were like, all right, yes, yeah, so what are your talking points? Like, I, have, I don't have any talking points. I mean, like, look, there's nothing, nothing on my sleeves, nothing in my hand, but like, hey, let's have a conversation. Your boss put out a bill or, you know, there's this, there's this thing that's happening and wanted to uh, give you the opportunity to like chat about what some of the impacts or consequences could be. And, once they flip from seeing you as a uh, something to be endured to a resource to be tapped into, uh, it completely changes the conversation. Um, I, I sort of love your question, and it's baiting me. You might have to ask it again in a little bit, because uh, it's baiting me into some things that I realized in real time yesterday during my keynote, like for the first time in the prep, um, which is. Uh, I'll hint at a negative. Um, some of the gatekeepers, some, uh, so I have five P's for, so first of all, when I talked to, this was a breakthrough moment with Suzanne and the FDA, by the way, I don't think it was for Suzanne, I think it was for Bakul, but um, we had a peace summit. We, we flew people in from all over the country on their own dime to go meet with the FDA on their turf. And there were some angry researchers and they were angry because no one was listening and it's broken, they need to fix this. And they didn't want to go. And I said, Maybe you were right. Maybe you were early. Like, give it one last try for me. We're going to meet them on our turf. Everyone's going to get to air their grievances. No one can listen until they've first been heard. So you're going to get five minutes to say what you want, need, and fear. All of us are. They're going to get their time to educate us. And once we have some common ground, let's see if there's anything we can do together. Um, so there's a mix there of maybe you were right, maybe you're early. It's a Bo's timing point. I actually think... Loft did incredibly important work. I don't think they were early. I think they did what was needed at the time they did it. And in fact, I just read Space for Rogue's Loft book. It's phenomenal and uh, made me smile the entire time, except for two points. Um, and uh, I'll get to Space for Rogue again in a second. So some of this is timing, but some of this is, um, you go back 10 years and you had to have permission to do something. Yeah. You, I mean, B-Size was born because people couldn't break into their first talk, the Black Hat. They couldn't get through the, the CFP process. I mean, that's why B-Size was born. Um, um, so some of this is the gatekeeping was suffocating. We weren't getting new ideas. Or we had really great O-Days drops or really seminal research done, but it was done by one person or one duo. And the world doesn't need one or two people who own that topic. They need... 200. We need college courses and d disciplines and, and certifications around these things if we want to serve the needs of a, an increasingly connected society. So one of the lessons with Bakul, back to that, at that meeting is even though we spent all morning establishing some neutral common ground and being heard, a brand new guy from FDA came in and scowling at us the entire time. He's looking at us like we're evil. And we, we have since befriended him. Don't worry, I'm not vilifying the guy. But he just looked pissed off. And the, what we were supposed to do on the agenda was say, how does a bill become a law for a researcher? So Billy Rios, one of those previously very popular, well, obviously still popular, prolific guys was going to outline, here's how I, I decide which equipment to go get. This is how I buy it off eBay. This is how I put it in my kitchen with my wife killing me. This is how I do the research. This is how I document the research. This is how I try. 
and none of it was being heard. Just the cool looked more and more mad the further we went. And I stopped in my tracks. I looked at Mike Murray. We had like a 90 minute conversation with no words in the course of three seconds. And I decided to abandon the plan. And I said, are we upsetting you? And he said, yes, yes, you are. And I said, is it, is it what we're saying or is it the words? Like, we should, we should take a moment here. And he said, what's wrong with you? I want to know why you do it. I don't care how you do it. I want to know why you do it. These are life-saving technologies. You're endangering the public's trust in these things. What do you want, money? You know, he just didn't get why we did it. I'm like, oh, okay. So what I tended to say was something like this. Hacking is not good or evil. It's magic. You've got bad wizards, but thank goodness you have Gandalf and Hermione and Harry to fight the darkness. So we're the good guys. And beyond that, we're not all even all motivated the same way. So I use the five P's. We have them on the website, but there's protectors that want to make the world safer. Puzzlers that want to take something apart, put it back together, solve the Rubik's Cube, make something do something it wasn't supposed to do. Uh, prestige, be the first, be the best, win the white jacket, own the topic. Profit. Do it you know, for personal or professional advancement for you or your company. And then we, depending on who we're talking to, we say uh, pro, uh, patriotism or protest for or against an ideology. So most of us major in one, minor in another, but what you have here is mostly protectors. We would lose sleep if we didn't feel we did everything we could to alert you of something that could have hurt people. And he's like, oh. We make your job really hard, don't we? <laughs> but, but, um, but then I think he was unstuck, and, and he ended up becoming an incredibly good ally, and he's the one who did the what, entrepreneur in residence that yeah. Bo and, and, and Andy Kravos did. So um, you triggered some of those stories, and I went outside the lines to tell them, but I think part of this is they were, they were right, but they were early. Part of this is we have a fairly toxic culture, which still remains, where certain people think they're better than everybody else or they deserve their props or no one else can contribute. And I, th I looked at the world very differently. I think everyone can contribute. And I think part of what I was rebelling against a little bit in my remarks yesterday is I was damaged enough and raw enough. I didn't care about imposter syndrome until I did again. And we showed that nobody's without, you know, you don't need permission and nobody's can have pretty amazing results. So yes, we took slings and arrows. Um, I think in an apt instinct, we had a bit of a pre-populated launch party where Space Road from Loft was a day one architect. Like we had been talking for months um, about how his cold dead heart was grew three sizes that day at, at ThoughtCon. <laughs> If you didn't see the picture of him drinking the, the beer that was with Andrea Matuition and, and Jericho, and Jericho and I had worked on the anonymous research for four years, and he was horrible to me when I started this. And we had a dim sum on the one year anniversary, and he's like, I still don't get it. What's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? And I don't remember how we got here, but the punchline was I said something just right, and he goes, Oh, you're playing the long game. <laughs> He's like, we're good. And he called off the hounds, right? <laughs> um, you know, but you're not, you, don't, you don't have as much anger and rage as he does if you don't care, right? The opposite of love is not hate, it's apathy. He cares. He tried a lot in unfavorable conditions. And once he saw what you we were doing, you know, but I can't tell you it's all roses, so I'm going to tie this off here. But some of our early collaborators, I mean, people kept hugging me this week and tearing my stitches. I'm like, oh, what happened? What happened? I'm like, well, I had a, a lump removed. But I kind of felt in my soul like, no, nope, that's, that's the reminder of the backstabbing that happened. Um, we had some severe sabotage. And we still are encountering some severe sabotage. Um, and I'm not going to make this a pity party for Josh and Bo, but like, something that someone came up to me and reminded me yesterday was when Bo and I answered the call during the pandemic to try to protect hospitals for everybody you love for really shitty pay and a ton of bureaucracy. 
every two weeks or so, we'd be called Nazis or baby killers by people that come to these conferences. Not just one, mostly one, but, you know, so I think part of this is you have to steel yourself to not, you know, not care. There's a line in um, a song from the 90s called, uh, from uh, Everclear. It says, we're possessed by a power bigger than pain. So you're not doing this to be popular. You're not doing it for prestige. If you're really doing it to protect, if you're, you got your North Star, you're going to win some people, you're going to lose some people. But, you know, if you're focused on the mission, then you kind of shake it off. Thank you both for doing this, and then specifically Josh for bringing up that point. I'd like to hear a little bit more about that experience. Um, you know, as I've experienced over the past five, six years, politics has become both polarizing and very personal uh, in communities, and this is no different than the other communities. And so I'd like to hear more about that thought process um, and that risk assessment of going into government and having to reconcile what it means to either work for a person or work for an administration that people may not support. Um, and then also realizing that it goes the other way as well. And that's just sort of where we are. And I don't personally think that there's going to be an end to that kind of polarization anytime soon. That's a, that's a deep question. Um, As I mentioned earlier, I was at the FDA for a year and I was at CISA um, and both of them were under the same administration. Uh, I, I would like to think that um, those positions were so low down that there was no political error about them, you know, capital P political, um, because there really wasn't, like they weren't at all political. Uh, but at the same time, like in you know, a decade ago, I didn't really know how government worked. And so I'm sure there's a lot of people- Do we yet? In our community, <laughs> to, no. <laughs> um, there's a lot of people in our community who still don't know and they've got a uh, very core strained understanding. And so maybe some people think that any work in government is political unless you're uh, you know, a career civil servant. Um, and I know that uh, you have probably faced some pretty severe uh, stuff because of also what you were doing. And I think that was that was our case, you know, going into work with CISA and people who don't understand that like other parts of government don't get more money when you do a good job in a different part of government. Like, like just basic misunderstandings about, about how these things function. Um, and you know maybe that's part of the uh, educational aspect of what we can do to help this community better is to to do more um, unraveling of government and public policy. And I'll put in a plug for uh, policy at DEF CON. If you're going out there, we've got uh, three fantastic days with four rooms that are just going to be heaving with talks uh, as well as a bunch of main stage stuff. Um, so if you're interested in that, learning more about it. Uh, come on out and, and maybe uh, get a finer grained understanding of how government works and how public policy works and uh, what is actually effective at, uh, at shifting things. Um, rapid fire answer. Um, at a macro level, I think this is ending, but cyber has remained a fairly nonpartisan, bipartisan issue so far. Um, I do think this is starting to unravel, but we have enjoyed some sort of uh, neutral turf. Um, we, thanks to our world now world famous intern, uh, we brought a Republican and a Democrat to DEF CON 25 in the first DC to DEF CON. The following year we had several elected officials, um, but it was Will Hurd from Texas, who's now, a, now a presidential candidate uh, and uh, recently retired Jim Langevin of Rhode Island. Um, they had so much common ground on this stuff. Like there was no daylight uh, among partisan issues. They may disagree on other topics, but no daylight between the two um, on cyber support. The Solarium Commission that drove and fueled the advancement of CISA, bipartisan. Uh, so at a macro level, it, we have not allowed politics to, to completely divide people. 
on Cyber yet. Point two, um, I know several cavalry people were offered White House jobs under different administrations, and some of them turned it down for different reasons. Not that they don't want to serve, they were willing to help, but didn't necessarily want to be labeled a D or an R. Um, third, um, when Andrea, um, Andrea Downing came to us, um, early on people wanted us to do some other cyber-ish privacy type things. And I tried at least early on to be very, very, very focused. Not that we don't care about privacy, but that I want to be very, very focused on areas that where no one was doing anything. And there were quite a few advocates already, but also things that would not break on partisan lines and public safety, you know, life and death stuff is, I felt would be future proof even when cyber became partisan, these topics may not. So I chose safer topics. Um, and then, you know, you've met several feds in the last couple of days. Um, these are lifelong public servants. You know, they have the heart of a servant. They want to make the world safer. They're going to see lots of political administrations come and go. So they're there to do that job and tend to keep their personal politics out of that job that lasts longer than an elected official. Um, so I don't think that's going to stay that way forever. Um, and we already took some, some slings and arrows. But when I had to make my own decision of do I do the CISA COVID task force, I didn't see how I could possibly say no. I felt like this moment was exactly what my life had been trending towards and I couldn't see on someone else doing it. Um, so I decided if I take some heat for this, that's okay. Um, and everyone chooses their own level of involvement. Um, but generally speaking, we just made it a decade without being political. So it's possible and hopefully for a bit longer. Did I answer Maurice's question? Where did Maurice go? Oh, there. Did I answer your question? Okay. I think it's going to get harder on certain topics. But we do take steps in our lexicon to specifically avoid those. So we measure twice, cut once on how we frame something, which will get, we're gonna actually touch on framing in a little bit. All right, may I move to the golden circle? Okay, if you haven't seen this, it's worth your 18 minutes. There's two versions, like one's like 12 minutes, someone trimmed it down, watch the whole, watch the longer one. Simon Sinek or Sinek uh, gave a transformational TED talk before TED was all glitzy at Puget Sound um, based on a book he says called Start With Why, but it's the golden circle. I'm not gonna do the whole lesson. It's, it's a really, he's an amazing speaker. And it's not just what he says, it's, the, it's his oration capabilities. Um, but he essentially says most companies can tell you what they do. Some of them can tell you how they do what they do. But the ones that change the world tell you why they do what they do. And they'll use examples like Apple says, you know, think different. Uh, and so versus like we make an MP3 player. Um, but he also talks about like Martin Luther King Jr. He's, he didn't say I have a plan. He said, I have a dream, right? People didn't go to the Million Man March because they cared about him. It's because they valued what he valued. So to, especially in our demographic, we focus on what and how. Like this is what I broke, this is how I broke it. I think we really flourished because we gave the North Star or the, 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 the raison d'etre or the why it matters. Jen Ellis yesterday gave us a video address on how they really wanted to protect hacker rights and decriminalize hackers through DMCA reform and CFA reform. And they didn't get very far initially. They were trying to say what the hackers wanted, but we became immediate teammates because I could go to the same Judiciary Committee, talk about my concerns over hackable medical devices, and like, oh my God, oh my God, how do we help? And we said, well, one for one, there's a chilling effect on good faith research because their fear of legal reprisal. You know, CFAA can be used to punish good faith contributions. Like, oh my God, well, we have to figure out a way to help you. Same exact destination, but we, made, we spoke to something they cared about. So that's partly empathy and partly talking about public safety of their constituents instead of something that we wanted. We can still get the same outcome. So um, often when I mentor brand new speakers, we, one of the things we try to do at all the different events or villages we do is we try to get brand new blood, brand new speakers to add their voice to the choir. Kind of a rebellion against gatekeeping, right? The opposite of gatekeeping. And some of them have really good knowledge, but they need a little polishing. So we found we kind of made a curriculum for public speaking. Um, and there have been some of our best voices. 
because they have experiences none of us would have had otherwise. But this is part of that curriculum, the, the Golden Circle. That was a short one. Just watch it. It's easy. <sighs> um, one of those is called Kurt Vonnegut's The Shape of Story. Um, a lot of people talk, but they don't necessarily know what the experience for your audience will be. And he just walks through most of the stories you've ever heard and diagrams on an XY axis. And it's hilarious and funny. I think it takes 10 minutes. But um, this isn't just about our presentations. It's that when we go to brief a, a senator or when we have to have a hard conversation with someone adversarial, we should know what's the right tool for the job here. You know, do we have one point to make? Do we have an inception to make that will come back and plant that seed and water it later? Um, but I do think this was more a trigger for me not to say that this is the only form of storytelling. Joseph Campbell has uh, the hero's journey. And, but um, I think a huge difference maker is we have attracted storytellers. A lot of us could not find what Billy Rios, but by the way, I, I, I got to stop using Billy. Billy's a phenomenal presenter. So uh, that's a, probably the worst example I could have picked. But some researchers are incredibly good at finding the thing, but they're incredibly terrible at telling someone why it matters or if it matters. So we realized we might have to have a chain, a relay race, where the ones that find it aren't the ones who communicate impact. And they may not, that person, that second person may not be the one that goes on the news. because They may not have media skills. It may be someone else entirely that develops the proposed remediations because breakers aren't necessarily fixers. That full stack hacker is elusive. Um, but what we did find is some of the most important breakthroughs with Suzanne, with, with the White House, with Congress have been powerful storytelling. Um, I, just, I did get to testify to Congress a couple of times. And next time you see a congressional hearing, watch the oral remarks. 99% um, of them will read something. Um, they'll just read. Senators can read. Um, it was really important to me as I got a little better at this that I just wanted to look them in the eye and make the point for them. At the moment, I want to look at the one I need to talk to you on the point I need to talk to you to make a connection, which means you're not going to be reading your script. So storytelling, shape of story, oration skills are fantastic. And to that end, um, if that's something you're interested in, this part of the boot camp would have things like listening to George Carlin tell why he was one of the most important. There's a great interview between John, a very young John Stewart and a very late career George Carlin where he says, I don't sing, I don't, oh, here's the, the, the preview. Uh, he said, they're like, why are you so good? You're just so captivating. People hang on your every word. He said, my father, who I never met, was a Carnegie award-winning orator. So part of it's DNA, like, you know, he just had really good oration skills from a father he never met. But also is like, I don't say my jokes, I sing my jokes. Da, 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 da. So there, there is neuro-linguistic programming and oration skills and pregnant pauses and change in pace that really change your ability to communicate to somebody else. And some of us are good at some of those tricks and some of us are good at more of those tricks. Um, but these are tricks just like empathy where those muscles can be built. So this was just a reminder that storytelling, shape of story, and having a consistent story and repeating the story uh, can help a lot. Anything to add? Stories are fantastic and phenomenal and they to grab somebody's attention. And if you only have five minutes with somebody, a single story that weaves in a bunch of elements uh, can make the difference between you getting uh, thanked for coming in to talk to them or another 15 or 20 minutes with them while they explore the story that you've just told. Um, and, you know, we've seen that happen several times where uh, somebody initially is just like, yeah, I don't know why I should care about this, but like, let's hear it. And you give them something compelling that they can tune into, that they can relate to. Um, and it doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to, to captivate them. Not everybody is gonna be captivated by the same thing. Uh, but then what started out as just, you know, somebody doing a favor and making an intro can become a meaningful relationship. Um, and the same is true with, with analogies. Uh, they're also really, really powerful ways for people to understand things and to gravitate towards them. 
And one of the things that I've learned is that it's not about having the perfect analogy. Everybody's like, no, no, your analogy is wrong. It's like, well, all analogies are wrong. You know, with, with apologies to, to what has been said about models, all analogies are wrong, but some are useful. And at the right time, the right analogy can be really useful. And what I find is that, uh, especially as I lose some of my technical skills, the more analogies I can stack up and become really comfortable flipping among them, I can still get the point of a lot of technical uh, conversations just by doing that. Uh, and I've seen that the, a similar thing is true with a lot of, um, a lot of other people who, you know, cybersecurity isn't their thing, hacking isn't their thing. But if they've got five analogies loaded up and they can just flip back and forth between them, then all of a sudden, like, they can get it. And then they can start to apply some of their other domain learning, knowledge, education, what works there, what doesn't work there, to this one in a way that can be way more powerful than if I just try and make something up from whole cloth. Um, part of oration skills as well, I mean, love analogies, love metaphors, and I think we've been pretty apt at those. Um, people like short lists. <laughs> they like odd numbered lists. They like uh, consonants and alliteration, like five Ps. Uh, they, they like something they can remember. There's clever turns of phrase that have some contrast and mirroring, like target rich, cyber poor. Um, some of this is just, uh, it's a mind virus. Like you try a bunch of these things and when you hear the Secretary of Homeland Security say target rich, cyber poor in a testimony, you're like, all right, I'm gonna keep using that one. <laughs> it got to him and then you hear Jen Easterly use it and then you hear Chris Inglis use it and then, and now it's in the consciousness and now they're singing your song and they don't even know it. And, but they're not just singing your song, they're adding to the music because they're improvising. You're, it's like if you saw the movie Inception, you're planting a really simple idea deep in their consciousness that has big, profound ripples. So some of this is you have to have sticky language. Uh, it's not just sticky language like protectors, puzzlers, prestige, profit, protests. Like they want to remember, what's that fifth one? Even if they don't remember it, they'll try to figure out what that fifth one was. Um, so one of the smart things we did on our first birthday is we made a five-star cyber safety framework for connected vehicles, like just five-star automotive. They already have something like that. It's in their consciousness, it's in their value set. Oh, what do you mean by safety, cyber safety? Like, how do you test the five stars? But so we, we hacked and pivoted a little bit, but we had fancy language, like secure by design, third party coordinate, um, coordination. But even after we had the flowery language that someone can read the technical document and the bullets and the meat on those bones, I could say it in one breath of oxygen. Basically all systems fail. We wanna know how you avoid failure, take help avoiding failure without suing the helper, capture, study and learn from failure, contain an isolate failure and inoculate against future failure. And they're not necessarily gonna remember that, but those five things, this is why I wanted Dave Rogers, those five things and their mapping exercise for public policy things that they could justify their code of practice, which then became a mandatory three things in legislation blessed by the queen, going into rulemaking soon as we learned this morning, they made law of the land. So remember on stage, I said we passed two laws. Make that three. <laughs> it wasn't us alone. It takes a village to raise these children. But if you look at this document, which cites cavalry work, many of the references in here cite cavalry work. Like we've sort of incepted Japan, ANISA, FDA, NTIA, but we didn't do it maliciously. We kept things fricking simple. And one of the guys that went to Ford Mead with us in that Avengers photo, David Etchu, he was at an IONS event and one of the other faculty members, he was doing an IOT session and someone said, hey, what about the five-star automotive cyber safety framework from the cavalry? And the guy made fun of it, trashed it. And David said, what's your problem with wanting to patch things? Like these cars have none of these five things. What's, what's the issue? He goes, oh, they're so basic, they're so simple. He said, that's the point. Like we can want all these different things, but it's taken 10 years to get even some of these five. Like we had to start somewhere and it wasn't to settle for less than we need, but these are, we also wanted them to be evergreen. 
So part of the lesson here is really small lists. Somebody latched on to two of them. Somebody else latched on a different two of them. But these things in almost the same language show up in different, different countries, different governments, different regulators, different best practices. Because we played Johnny Appleseed and we sewed a handful of small ideas from odd numbered lists that are memorable and can fit within a cohesive elevator pitch. So um, I encourage you to look at IOTSecurityMapping.com. It's not comprehensive, but in the world of IoT, um, they made a mind map that you can cross navigate and say, okay, this notion of coordinated vulnerability disclosure programs, what are all the documents that relate to it? What are all the things that support it? And they could show a critical mass of support to push something. And I hope no one ever really figures out exactly how many of those dots we pushed. Um, but there's probably a couple points baked into that. But that's an oration skill is a consonance, alliteration, small numbers, memorable metaphors. Okay, there's others on the list on the agenda. I'm happening to get to the tab called The Goal. Has anyone read The Goal? Raise your hand. Has anyone read The Phoenix Project? Oh, a few more. Do you know The Phoenix Project is the goal for IT? Uh, I had a mentor at IBM who made me read this awful book. Uh, it's not awful. It's a, it's a, it was a fictional novel of a failing manufacturing plant in Ohio, I think. And it's used to introduce what's called the theory of constraints. Um, whether caliberly members and teammates of the last 10 years know this or not, I use the theory of constraints every single day. And it's, it's both a blessing and a curse. If you understand the theory of constraints, you can't unsee it. Did it go away? I didn't do that. Apparently you can unsee it. <laughs> okay. So uh, Eliada Goldratt uh, came up with the theory of constraints. It's important to read the book. It basically tells you the same thing over and over and over iteratively until you kind of get it. But without doing the entire story or the entire theory, basically US manufacturing was dying and this guy saved it. He'd saved it through this badly written, it's, it's, it's well written, I'm being a little coy. This, it's not flowery language is what I meant to say. Um, but this book is transformative for most people that read it. Uh, and essentially the US manufacturing was dying and our economy was suffering and we were doing the wrong things the wrong way. So when robots came into manufacturing lines to replace people, they cost a lot of money. So people said, I bought this robot, we better use it all the time. And manufacturing is a series of stations on a snake. And they wanted to use it all the time, so they kept making and pumping out parts for that station. And it was faster than the people before it or after it. And these businesses were going out of business. And they found themselves in a hole and they started digging faster. So this mentor figure comes to this guy whose plant's closing and his marriage is falling apart. And he says, what is the goal of every company? And Socratically eventually gets him to, well, it's to make money. Well, how do you make money? Well, you fulfill orders customers. Well, how do you fulfill court orders of customers? And he just keeps going down and asking all these questions. And what it eventually reveals is that every system flow has a constraint, a bottleneck. So somewhere on that line of 20 stations, there's a bottleneck. And your job, if you're trying to optimize for making money, which is fulfilling orders, then you have to actually finish the good and set, ship the order and bill it. So your job is to find the constraint, exploit the constraint, which will create a new constraint and then you're instant repeat. And what that really meant is if you optimize before a constraint, you create excess surplus inventory and you go out of business, which is what they were all doing because their measurement, they're measuring the wrong thing, they're measuring the productivity level of the expensive robots instead of flow. If you optimize after the constraint, it gets you nothing. So it's a lot of work and maybe you did something that could eventually be good later, but you get no yield. So again, all systems are a snake. They all have a constraint. If you optimize before the constraint, you create surplus inventory and go to business. If you optimize after the constraint, you get nothing in return. And there will always be a constraint. So once you've solved for that one, find the next one. Um, some people don't know why I changed my focus so many times, but once you see a constraint, if you wanna have impact, you have to flood to the constraint. 
You can get some parallel action, but this goal concept is transformative. They even have a graphic novel version if you don't want to read the bad thing. I got it for Christmas from my lovely wife. Um, and the Phoenix Project, Gene Kim and I bonded after already being friends um, when I said, I read this terrible book that my mentor made me read. He goes, oh my God. Because as he was telling me the story of the Phoenix Project, I'm like, are you writing the goal? He's like, you know the goal? So he wrote the goal for IT. And quickly, if you haven't read the goal uh, in the, the Phoenix Project, it's a failing manufacturing online auto parts thing whose IT is the constraint. And he relives some of these principles, but he adds three. Because in the DevOps, CI, CD world, or continuous integration, continuous delivery, three ways in IT is number one, Visualize how work flows from left to right throughout the organization. Number two, create and amplify feedback loops and instrumentation. And number three, create a culture of continuous experimentation and learning. So he built on the base bottom line of the constraints with that visualization, but then suggested greater level sampling rates and experimentation. So, um, you will both thank me and scream at me at some point in your career when you notice um, the goal in action. But I will tell you that if you caught the CISA COVID Task Force Lessons Learned panel of the lovely ladies from CISA COVID Task Force, like Lisa Young and Michelle Holko and Kendra Martin, all national treasures, we use the theory of constraints every single day during the pandemic. And we prevented a mass waste and spoilage of the first Pfizer vaccines because we could see that we did not have enough dry ice or co ultra cold stain storage. So never in my wildest imagination did I think that the theory of constraints would save lives, but we did spot poor assumptions about the availability of dry ice and ultra cold refrigeration during Operation Warp Speed. Um, and given how many elderly people were dying at that point, every lost pallet was extra dead people. So um, theory of constraints is critically important, at least to the way I do target selection. And if someone does wanna change the world, part of that boot camp is we're gonna help them understand dynamically watching for new constraints. One way to put this differently is headwinds and tailwinds. I didn't set out to um, have such an outsized focus on medical devices. In fact, we started with um, automotive. There's only 20 automakers that we were going to have to win over. That seems easy. There were 10,000. There are 10,000 medical device makers. Of those 10,000, the average employee count is, what, 11 or something like that? But of those 10,000, 100 of them are large and 10 of them are huge. And at least, at least that was the count a couple of years ago. But we figured, let's not bother with medical yet. But the reasons we did is we had such an incredible ally immediately with common cause, common purpose. So we saw an opportunity in tailwinds and we took advantage of that. One philosophy could have been, let's spend 10% of our team on healthcare, 10% of our team on auto, 10 on maritime. We could have spread the penicillin dust across all the sick patients and cured none of them. But at some point we could recognize the movements and we saw that Suzanne was willing to go further faster and then we had to adapt and say, this is an exemplar. If we invest in an exemplar, we can then cross pollinate this proven recipe. Jessica in energy and commerce took that and she's like, wait a second, I'm responsible for healthcare and I'm responsible for auto. Healthcare is embracing hackers, auto isn't doing anything. So we pulled together a, a round table and said, hey, uh, hackers are working with Suzanne really nicely. We like this. You're not doing this. You should do that on your own or we'll make you do it. Something along those lines. I'm paraphrasing. But we couldn't hold up pressure on the auto regulators until we had a success story with Suzanne. So that's not necessarily a theory of constraints, but we also have to kind of like watch the biorhythm of where we have resistance and where we have permission. And in hindsight, I can't imagine doing it other way, but um, but we are unevenly distributed. It's like that William Gibson quote I always use for the S-bomb meetings, the future is here already, it's just not evenly distributed. So, but by virtue of having something that worked, David Rogers, a copper horse in the UK, could put this in the IoT code of practice. Uh, when you do a proof of concept or pilot for healthcare S-bomb, someone can't say it's, it can't be done because they did it. When Schneider Electric has 4,000 S-bombs and counting on programmable logic controllers, 
you don't get to make the excuse anymore that no one can do it in OT. They're, they've done 4,000 times. So I think a part of this lesson is um, reading the system dynamic and watching the flow, which sometimes is related to theory of constraints. Maybe I beat a dead horse on that one, but suffer through the book. How are we doing on time? How long are we supposed to go? I don't know. We're going to go all night. We are the new Rat Pack. No. no. Okay. Um, we hit most of the things that I advertised, and we do want to pivot a little bit to what's the future. Um, part of the boot camp, what's that? Okay. Part of the boot camp, if we have a boot camp, is going to be how the heck does government work? Um, I'm not going to do the whole thing now, but I'm going to show you what it will look like if you want to remind me later. Hey, Josh, I want to see that thing later. Um, so remember Schoolhouse Rocks? Who's old enough to remember Schoolhouse Rocks? Okay. The part they leave off is even when you pass a frickin' law, it has to go through rulemaking. And sometimes they just choose not to do it. But they're doing the IoT one finally. Um, okay. Do you, if you were in the keynote, you saw these. I'm not going to do all of them. But um, the lexicon... It's daunting. It took me many years to figure out what the heck the public-private partnership meant, or what the heck is a GCC versus an SCC, or what the heck these things do. And some of this is about to be rewritten, or at least heavily reformed, thanks to a lot of these visuals and people realizing the old methods don't work. I'm not going to do all of them, but what's the public sector? Can someone answer me what the public sector is? Someone who gets paid by taxpayer money. What's the private sector? Somebody who's paid by money. Okay. So, um, yeah, there, there's different definitions, and I, I won't do this Socratically the whole time. Um, oh, Steve, you were a public servant. Uh, do you have a definition? Public sector versus private sector? Governments. There's, yeah, non nonprofits and NGOs are a little different. Um, one, one way an economist looks at this is, and this is why it's confusing, by the way, uh, private, there's public goods and private goods when you talk to an economist, right? There's what's right for me is a private good or my company, my shareholders is a local optimum and what's good for the public good is a global optimum, right? So take Colonial Pipeline. Their choice is optimized for their shareholders and their billing. But the consequence was Eastern seaboards without fuel for a while. So the private good trumped public good, and that's what we call a failed market in economic terms. I'm not going to be econ economist, economist 101 here, but generally speaking, there's public interests, which is everybody, and private interests, which are more local. Yet we call it publicly traded companies. So private for profit, we call publicly traded. So it gets really confusing. Um, I could use some more bourbon. Um, so the public-private partnership is that there should be some healthy tension between what's right for you as a company and what's right for the country. Well, the way the U.S. government defined critical infrastructure, in fact, I believe the primary author is going to be a DEF CON because I think he's on my panel. Um, during the Obama administration, there was a presidential policy directive 21 built on with 41, built on with this thing called the NSERP. Doesn't matter, it's a bunch of acronym soup. But if you don't know how the government works and the three, three branches of government and checks and balances and what some of these governing philosophies are, then you can waste years barking up the wrong tree. Um, this is not to demean the people who asked Suzanne's team some questions. Suzanne's got regulatory authorities for medical devices. And some of the questions that were thrown at her were, how do you fix hospitals? She doesn't have any jurisdiction over hospitals. So navigating and mapping who has authorities for which things how does a bill become a law? It's different in the UK. I didn't even know until today that the Queen's consent, Queen's, uh, the royal assent is the final straw. Yeah. Okay. Now the King's, King's uh, at the end is the final, final, final signing the bill into law. Um, and, and things start with the speech, right? The Queen's speech, which sets the agenda. So I learned things about different governments across the country, but at least in the US, without being exhaustive, Presidential Policy Directive 21 set up 16 
critical infrastructure sectors. These are the 16. It's things like water and wastewater, food and ag. Uh, each one has a custodian, uh, an agency or plural agencies that are responsible for the national critical functions within that critical infrastructure sector. They're very siloed and risk does not fit neatly within those, but that's how we chose to do it. So in the case of healthcare and public health, it's HHS or Healthy Human Services. Uh, in the case of energy, it's Department of Energy. In the case of water and wastewater, it's EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. Many of them are quite territorial. And when we were in government, they told us to stay out of your lane, stay out of our lane, you're in our lane. And they didn't understand that CISA's role was to be horizontal across all the lanes, but um, that's a different story. But before CISA, uh, there's a GCC or Government Coordinating Council and an SEC, a Sector Coordinating Council. You've probably heard of this, Financial Services Sector Coordinating Council, Healthcare Sector Coordinating Council. And they have a special privileged relationships. They get CPAC protected conversations and they can negotiate more directly without lobbying rules and et cetera, et cetera. And that's how it tends to work. Then CISA was born because they started to realize two things. One is they were competing for workforce from a finite resource pool uh, for physical security talent, cybersecurity talent. So do you need to a healthcare specific incident response team, or can you have a CISA bench of incident responders that HHS can call upon? And there's a shared responsibility, it's not that clean, but the second reason is it's not easy to manage risk across these things. Some things touch plural sectors. So the CISA became the nation's risk management center and could identify and buy down risk on things like provide medical care. Sounds like a HHS thing, but it needs water from EPA, electricity from DOE, transportation, et cetera. And I'm not going to show more, more of that, but I'm going to go really fast to the end because um, we're trying to change those rules. And something I didn't show on the screen was, uh, oh, by the way, um, look at that beautiful software bill of materials graphic. Um, this notion that you have a final goods assembler like a medical device that Suzanne's team does pre-market and post-market regulation of that gets sold in the hospitals and it's either a safe device or an unsafe device and it can either be okay right now or hacked later. But that final goods assembler is 95% open source and those open source parts have other open source parts and it's turtles on turtles all the way down. So that tree, you're gonna see it in a second. Patch Act made that much easier. And the president recently came out with his national cybersecurity strategy through the Office of National Cyber Director and National Security Council. And one of the major people just retired from that and spoke to us yesterday. And there's five pillars in there, but they're essentially saying the public-private partnership needs a rebalancing that um, voluntary alone, free market forces only take you so far. There's a time and a place to use government power. That time is now. We need to preserve the trust and safety of the public for designated critical infrastructure. Uh, I'm going to put these together in a really ugly unified field theory. Um, go back to this because people get confused. So here we go. Ugly, ugly, ugly slides. And we'll do more later if you ever do a boot camp. But the kind of things in these ugly models where some models are wrong, all of them are useful. No, all of our models are on something useful. This is those 16 sectors. I'll get to you in a second, sir. This is the 16 sectors. Um, who's heard of the NIST cybersecurity framework? Who has done all 400 pages? Okay. So the NIST cybersecurity framework is voluntary. When I was at Fort Meade with the story of the Avengers that I told you about um, with Ann Neuberger, um, the uh, the Chamber of Commerce and the private sector did not want one of the laws to pass. There was a Rockefeller Snow bill. There was a Lieberman McCain bill. They did not want regulation. So the grand bargain was, let's do a voluntary thing and let's have NIST do it. So NIST came up with this NIST cybersecurity framework written by the private sector for the private sector. And it was a framework, not a standard, you know all that. So the blue here is all 16 sectors can voluntarily apply those 400 pages of controls, all of them. And that little Punnett square up there says there's the haves and the have nots. We haven't done yet, but there's basically a push to should we converge and harmonize to the point I made to the UK group? Do we harmonize internationally and collapse all these standards into something simpler? Assuming we've, we've done it all well, we just need to streamline it. Or do we have to diverge to make sector specific things that are fit for purpose? And one of the lines that got me in trouble with NIST, even though they couldn't disagree with it, it was at the end of my Senate testimony last year, I said, they, they said, well, what about NIST? And I said, well, um, we have a decade of voluntary NIST cybersecurity framework and a recent survey from shows that 
most critical infrastructure owners and operators have volunteered to ignore it. Um, it's not that it's, it's a bad list, it's that voluntary only takes you so far. All right, so that's the blue. Every single one of these operational environments could do the NIST cybersecurity framework. Click. Well, what about the have-nots? So there's the, the haves that go to ISACs that are well-funded, and there's the have-nots that don't. So the, the White House asked CISA to come up with these cross-sector harmonized cyber performance goals. You might have heard of them. There's 36, 38 controls that are the crawl stage of crawl, walk, run. So it is the NIST framework. But it's like, if you haven't started anywhere, start here. So this yellow is going to be the NIST cybersecurity framework goals. And then they asked the sector coordinating councils and the public-private partnerships, you should layer some sector-specific things on that. And then the White House National Cybersecurity Strategy, I think Ann's idea was where there's existing regulatory authorities, you should use them. And whether you lack them, you should ask for them because we need to have some minimum standards. And the nudge was start with the CPGs, add a little flourish, and then you can get a subset of the overall NIST cybersecurity framework and then it says, well, that's a lot on the operators, but we also talked about maybe we need to shift the liability from the victims to the suppliers that put them in harm's way in the first place. So is there minimum hygiene? So there's some stuff like there. That's where you say, what about SBOM? Well, each of those operational environments buy a series of supplies from suppliers. Medical devices are about to be safer from Suzanne's team. So each of those has a supply chain, roots of the tree. And this is where things like software liability has been floated like as a final goods assembler should you be responsible for known defects and known exploitive vulnerabilities you pass downstream without disclosing them and things like log4j when there's a log4j do we know immediately which of those subsectors are hit and how badly so that regulators can warn so there's stuff like that now that was much more detailed than the superficial stone soup and there's lots more there but like it took me a decade to sort of maybe understand A, how it's intended to work, B, where it doesn't work, and as a result, PPD-21 is being heavily rewritten right now. It's not going to be thrown out. We'll still have sectors and we'll still have subsectors, but the notion that these national critical functions can be driven by one and only one sector risk management agency, has been, that, that bubble has been burst, we hope. But if you're trying to pass a law or something and you're pushing on the wrong agency entirely, um, then you could waste a lot of time. So part of the cyber civics lesson will be, what are the fastest paths? Do you wanna start in Congress? Do you wanna start with a regulator? Is this something you wanna do from the private sector first? Um, it completely depends on which sector. We have a really strong regulator at the FDA. We are missing regulators for some of these sectors entirely. Uh, we have a really good ISAC in many of these sectors. There was no ISAC for food until recently. So knowing those constraints and where there's headwinds and tailwinds might be the difference maker. For example, transportation on the road, DOT. Transportation on the railway, TSA. So sometimes even the transportation of food can take on slightly different um, overlapping jurisdictions. I spent more time on that than I meant to, but like it is a labyrinth, and I'm sure half the stuff I just said is wrong, but even though I tested it with White House and they seem to like it. So, um, but this is, um, you can get lost really easily. You can talk to the wrong committee jurisdiction in Congress and spend all your time convincing somebody who has no authority to push that forward. It's different in the Senate than it is in the House. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kill that thread. Anything to add, Bo? No. All right, so any other audience comments before we say more? Yes, you, you were very patient. Yesterday, during the water discussion, I uh, sort of brought up a point and I never drop it because there's no way to, oh, thank you. Yesterday, during the water discussion, we the problem came up of what do you do about all the uh, city-owned, you know, public util water utilities and, and wastewater treatment systems, and they only have one person. Uh, and and how do we get them? Uh, first of all, to comply. How, how do we get them the resources they need to comply? And we kind of all generally nodded in the direction of it's a problem. Is that an, an area for future focus? Because are you familiar with the everybody, nobody, somebody poem? No. 
I'll send it to you. Um, but basically, everybody knew that somebody should do something, but nobody wanted to do that, and so on. Uh, we seem to be in that situation where there's a whole bunch of things going on out there in critical infrastructure where you look at all of those lines and arrows and boxes and at the bottom of it it's yeah but it's either you can't get them to care or they don't have the resources yep. and maybe that's an area to try and tease out of it so i should take you on the road with me because i did was looking for the best pivot to the other half of where do we do where we go from here um I have cognitive dissonance, and if there was an easy answer of what to do with the cavalry, I would have put it in the keynote yesterday. I have struggled every single day since January 12th when I woke up and realized it was a decade from the death. Like I just said, okay, I have to make a decision. What are we doing? Mission accomplished. So remember, at the top level, well, there's end it. We've done a bunch of great work. People can study it. We'll document it, whatever. Transform it. to be what's missing now instead of what was missing then. Read the room, organize accordingly, or combine with other groups to get critical mass. Because we are in many ways force divided right now. With, we, have, we have an embarrassment of riches with volunteerism on projects, um, but I am starting to feel and see evidence that it's shifting from uh, impact to activity. Not everywhere. Um, but some of the policymakers feel good because they talked to a hacker and may not have been the right hacker or to depth or to action, but, but the engagement's there, that's good, but the follow through in the campaign is not. Um, or they only have a limited attention span and you can't throw all the issues at them. So, um, and it's not up to me, like people can do whatever they want to do, but w at least for my contributions for the next period of time and the people we organize, um, I want to be thoughtful and deliberate. Um, so I wasn't going to say this, but um, also for people that want to start something to change the world, like Bo and I have a couple nonprofits we advise or sit on that aren't even the cavalry, right? Um, what do you got? You had the I ICS Village, Aerospace Village. We're on a board for the 501C3 for the CyberMed Summit. How you do your paperwork, if you pick a C3 or a C4 or a C6, have hugely different legal and tax implications. And if you don't know, you might start the wrong one. <laughs> um, so some of this boot camp would involve people we, that we don't have the expertise, but we could, we, we've come to find the people who do have said expertise. So some of this is just like your basic architectural mission, vision, goals, operating structure could be helpful. So the target rich side report, I, I will do probably one minute elevator pitch on a couple ideas I had for the cavalry, but I don't think it's up to me. I think it's up to the coalition of the willing that reveal themselves. Because when we launched here, we said, join us in eight weeks at DerbyCon where we're gonna have a constitutional Congress, establish our mission vision goals with the people that show up. So we didn't know the final, in fact, we didn't really finalize it till ShmooCon following spring. We finalized it? No, I guess we didn't finalize it. <laughs> Touche. So, um, you know, part of what I was saying yesterday is reveal yourself as someone who wants to fix a problem and we will talk about it. Um, Steve had a great idea that he wants to sell me on later at the bar. Okay, so target rich cyber poor is kind of where my heart was going after I left CISA. What I realized is for those 16 sectors, if they have an ISAC and a sector coordinating council, and not all of them do, and if they're effective, and not all of them are, they tend to have the well-funded top 15 hospitals, top 15% hospitals, the Mercs, the Pfizer's. And if you're in financial services, the biggest banks are the most important players. But in most of the other sectors, the risk is diffuse. It's either bipolar or geographically separated. For water and wastewater, it matters where it's delivered, not just how big the city is, because then you have a socio-demographic inequality problem. So, a deep concern I have is most of the public-private partnerships have participation and advancement for the interests of those who join, and without malice, they are very skewed to the haves, not the have-nots. So I think the reason I was trying to incept the federal government with Target Rich Cyber Poor is they at least try to dampen that bias. And 
some of CIS's programs are looking at K through 12 schools, small, medium rural hospitals, um, municipalities, wastewater, and wastewater. So in their annual strategy alignments, there is more paid there. One of the reasons the White House pushed so hard on shifting liability responsibilities is because the cost is being pushed to those who cannot bear it. It's also not economically efficient. It's not just about means, it's also inefficient markets. So that, I had built this deck that had this, the schoolhouse rocks to show, I'll just jump to that picture. I thought the thesis for the next stage of the cavalry was not all cyber physical systems, but rather the time sensitive, latency sensitive subset of the 55 national critical functions that if you shut them off for 24 to 48 hours, people die. Not everything kills people, right? If you shut them off for 24 to 48 hours, do people die? Is there a crisis of confidence in the public to trust the government to govern? It doesn't fix the banks. It doesn't fix intellectual property. It's not the only lens, but you could have somebody focused on that. So I wanted to look, can the cavalry look at the target rich cyber poor for water and wastewater, which was in yesterday's lineup, small, medium, rural electrical co-ops in yesterday's lineup, the food supply in yesterday's lineup and emergency care. And I think we could be plenty busy finding ways to give actionable advice, free technology stacks, crisis management plans at scale, to target rich cyber poor, basic human needs at the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy. That was a little bit longer than a minute because I had to find the right slide. That is an idea that we could go forward with. Number two. If you saw my visual that we've had 200 rural hospital closures in the last several years, the reason I was so proud of the Patch Act is better devices help large, medium, small, and rural hospitals. Everybody benefits. But because the average deployed lifespan of a device is 15 years, you have to actually still be a hospital long enough to enjoy the fruits of that. And if we're having 700 ransoms a year with a six plus week disruption to income when you have four weeks cash flow on hand, we could see a whole lot more lost rural hospitals. So part of me said, I can't do this spread myself too thin across four sectors. There isn't much of a public private partnership in food and ag yet. Water and wastewater suing the regulator right now for daring to ask about CPGs. I can't spend 10 more years building a trust relationship like Suzanne, right? There's not a lot of Suzannes out there. We can try to find them, but Will that get there? So what if thesis two is go really, really deep on finishing the job for hospitals? Because you got to keep people alive. And then I got overwhelmed because that's not enough. I can't do these sectors serially. So idea three. Maybe we need 20 cavalries, which gets to that incubator accelerator boot camp notion of the first half of this chat. You know, Bo and Jen and Josh cannot and will not do two day jobs for another 10 years. But could we have advisors, mentors into these new change agents? So if there's five of you with five different ideas, we could have five parallel movements or whatever the heck you want to call it. It has less prone typos for where they killed Jesus of Nazareth. Um, you can call it whatever you want. Um, but could we have some way to get scale and parallelism by both assisting in times of crisis, advising, training, mentoring. Uh, I also think it would have the additional benefit that donators, people who are philanthropic, they don't want to waste their money. They're willing to give it to the public good, but they don't want to squander it on somebody who gives up a year later. So sometimes they're more confident in the private sector investing in someone who's in a team that helps each other. They may be more confident that Cavalry Academy initiatives do better. So let's give money to people that are willing to join the Cavalry Academy. You know, that's not the name, but you know. Hey, be careful. That's what you said 10 years ago I about I am the Cavalry. Okay. One, one, one sec. There's more than just those three ideas. Sorry to just direct it at you. I should be making eye contact with others. We talked last year about what the Michigan Cyber Corps is. We did a lot at the federal level or the country level. There are certain things that are much better done at the local level. And you could have a 50 state experiment. We could have cyber core of engineers. We could have incident response. As long as we have legal protections, right? Because that gets touchy. We could have incident response or professional, I mean, lawyers built into their profession have pro bono work. You're expected to do 
and encourage to do pro bono work? Could we have public good cybersecurity talent pools? Ayan Islam, who was here yesterday, our intern now in the White House, she's in charge of the ONCD workforce strategy. So there, there are some concepts here where we could have a much more federated, franchised blueprint or even parallel experimentation like you've done. And if you wanna see that talk from last year, fantastic. Arizona's doing something different. Colorado's doing something different. Boston's doing something different. So there's a number of good ideas, but I like the idea of channeling someone's instinct to make the world a safer place and giving some parallel action. I have fears though, that there is a finite pool of resources, a finite number of tracks at DEF CON and Black Hat and here. And we are, as, whether we mean to or not, we're kind of zero sum competing for finite resources. And what's worse is for some of the policymakers is uh, they're getting a little overwhelmed on who to listen to and what to listen to, because when everything's important, nothing's important. So there was an effort before the pandemic that Eli Sugarman put together to try to see if we can have some unified platform across all the different philanthropics that he had funded. That meeting didn't go very well, but not because it was a bad idea. It's just, um, I don't think we were ready yet to try to find a common platform or a common agenda yet. And then the pandemic happened. All right, so Russ. Uh, I rise in favor of the Cavalry Academy. Oh. Uh, seriously. Um, but I want to invite, and this is me volunteering, by the way. I want to invite elevating the vision for it. So boot camp and, and the way you've talked about it has a very kind of rustic and somebody throw together a slide deck and give me a gif for this and we'll have an animal act and people will come away charged up. Um, I don't know how many graduate schools of public policy there are in the United States, but there's a lot. How many graduate schools are there of public health? How many graduate schools of management are there? There is a large established pool, pool and institutional framework for graduate education about how to make change and, and we'll call it make the world a better place, but in the discipline of administration and public policy and organization policy. I think there is a huge opportunity to take the lessons learned general and specific from the last 10 years and boil them down in a different way, not in a public consumption way, but in an academic way, in a theoretical way, in a rigorous way. So I would like to see not the, the breezy popular book about the I Am Academy. I wanna see a 500 page textbook that's theory and practice in case studies that goes into great levels of detail that puts those people who are in those graduate programs who are gonna make this their career that they learn from this. Because what you guys have done, you guys collectively, is incredibly valuable beyond what you've done, beyond the three laws, beyond the actual activity. There is a pool of knowledge here that if we can crystallize it in, I'm gonna use a fancy word, reify it, make it concrete and, and tangible in an education sense, could take your idea of federation to a whole new level. And I think I can help with that. You said you're volunteering. Does that mean you're going to write the 500-page book? I, maybe. I think I may have some time on my hands. Uh, He's good at that kind of thing. I know. I know. I am a man of many words. <laughs> <laughs> Any other visceral reactions or completely different ideas? And don't forget the bourbon. Uh, I think I'm probably a little bit biased based on where I come from, but I'd also, my, my visceral reaction is strongly in favor of the academy slash boot camp slash higher education, uh, whatever, um, just because I feel like uh, that scales, or it, it seems to me that that would scale better to uh, solving this issue as a, at a worldwide level. I, I personally am not, uh, you know, American. I, I live elsewhere, and I, I feel like um, th this is a problem that other countries are, are, are going to encounter, and I think a lot of pl places, even if they aren't gaining from the specific knowledge of, like, the intricacies of the, the U.S. government and how it works, I think a lot of the lessons are, of how to talk to diplomats, how to talk to people in government are likely to be applicable across multiple uh, countries, 
and by by scaling out that way, uh, I feel like the impact could be a, a lot more and help a lot more people. Mm. Thank you. Um, I think Maurice had to leave, but um, can you explain the program Maurice went through? Uh, yeah, so there's there's a program called Tech Congress. Who's heard of Tech Congress? Uh, a couple of people, okay. So Tech Congress is a pretty awesome program. Um, I think our first year we had uh, Travis, who founded it, second, come second, second year and talk about it. Uh, and I, I probably won't do it justice. But um, basically, if you're a technologist who wants to do stuff in public policy, uh, they have a program where you can sign up, um, go through a vetting process, application, all that. And you get, at the end of that, uh, placed with a congressional office for one year with pay, with a boot camp. I think right, they run like a two week boot camp. Um, and it has produced some incredibly effective technologists who have become uh, public policy powerhouses, like Maurice, who is here, who's awesome, um, like several other people. Uh, and there's a couple of other programs that are kind of similar, uh, and they, they teach some of the policy theory and practice, um, but I don't think they teach like empathy. I don't think no. they teach, you know, the, uh, the theory of constraints and uh, things like that. So I think that there's, um, even with some of those programs, which are starting to get more, um, there are opportunities to, to do more with that. Oh, uh, incidentally, uh, part of the boot camp, even though I can't make them on my own yet, these, these things are called Wardley maps. They are amazing in the hands of someone that knows them. Simon Wardley and create, created the concept, and I only use the vertical axis. They're even better when you use the horizontal axis. Um, but systems thinking is one of the things we want to teach. And I, I, I spent about nine months figuring out, can you teach systems thinking or do you have to be you know, attuned to be a systems thinker? And I found some people that absolutely believe you can teach it. Um, but the reason I brought up the Maurice thing is, I'll get to you in a second. Um, I was very defeated during Hack the Capital. Who's who knows the ICS Village? And so, so Bryson's group also runs a conference in DC called Hack the Capital, different than the Hackers on the Hill, sometimes conflated. But Hack the Capital is a pretty decent conference. He had almost the same track we did last year, but six months later with gubbies that are that can drive there. So a fairly compatible um, focal area. And I was demoralized because I felt like the Patch Act passing into law in a bipartisan way against millions of dollars of lobbyists against it was evidence that we had a window of bipartisan support, that this is a public safety issue. And even if the private sector doesn't want it, we're gonna do it anyhow. So we had bipartisan House and Senate get that far. In parallel, we had ONCD and NSC with Ann and Chris Inglis saying we need to rebalance public-private partnerships and ask more and do more. So you had executive branch support and congressional support and life and death stuff, evidence of harm. And I watched during that conference a ton of the right people in the room and it felt like they were gonna blow it. Like we were still getting lawsuits from the EPA, we we're losing our political will. We spent every piece of energy we had to get the stuff on the table and we didn't have enough energy to see it through. And I was pretty depressed about that. And talking to Casey John Ellis and Carl and others, I realized that we had about a dozen friends in ONCD and NSC in the White House. And they were junior staffers when we met them. And back to that antidote to gatekeeping, part of our attitude is we invested in every single person that wanted to work with us. Everyone. We didn't. It wasn't a permission thing. It wasn't a skills thing. If you wanted to work with us, we invested in you. And what I said to Casey is, I think we're going to miss this Overton's window, and we might not get another one for 10 years. But the heartening part was, if we have 12 people in the corridors of power who know our song and are adding to it, maybe 10 years from now, we can have 50. You know, we can, have, we can farm Suzanne's instead of looking for them. And look, Jessica's <laughs> in... I wish I could clone her. No. Uh, uh, modification? No, 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 no. So Jessica was um, said like two hours ago. Uh, I was I was a junior staffer, right? 
now she's in FDA doing amazing work and was one of the first people to pioneer the ONCD, the Office of National Cyber Director. Mayan was our intern, and now she's in ONCD running something. Nick Leiderson was a, a staffer for Langevin, and he's one of the leadership figures in ONCD. So we, we have that part. I don't think it's going to be enough to cross the finish line right now in this window we worked so hard to create. And I think the world will stay more dangerous. But when I think longer or generational, then we should be investing in tons of students and tons of junior staffers and tons of first year public servants. And that's the part that gives me hope is the generational investment. So that might be very compatible with your amendment. It might be doubling down on tech Congress that Travis started. It could be a, a all of the above approach, but we're, we're gonna have to look about what does the world need 10 years from now? And I think that's usually gonna be inform, inspire, influence, and educate. Uh, a couple of quick thoughts. One is you might uh, advocate with the nice people at the Tech Congress to give you some of that sweet, sweet space for their little boot camp and provide some education because that's, that's an ongoing program and it exists, burrow into it. Um, with respect to going the academic route, that's cool, I, it's, it's good. Um, and it's probably like for people who are younger than me, so I can play the ageism card, I'm old enough <laughs> to do that. Um, I, I think it would be fabulous to maintain uh, some level of outreach, say at B-sides, um, for those who, are, who, for whatever reason, at their stage of life, they're not going to go into grad school. It's not going to happen, okay? Because I don't got the time, I don't got the money. But we can do stuff like this also. That's all. Thank you. Well, uh, you heard from Spanky yesterday. He's not in going to grad school. Uh, and he's found his third wind of public service uh, and stepped up hugely during the pandemic. Bigly? He stepped up bigly. Um, and he makes a mean slide deck. All right, anyone else? We didn't know where this was going to go. I really loved the UK stuff this morning. I wish I wish I had pulled up more of your content. Steve. Steve, who are you? What did you just do and what are you doing now? I'm Steve Kelly. I'm now at IST uh, as the chief uh, trust officer, was at the White House, was at FBI. Uh, I'm inspired by this conversation. And um, I was, interestingly, I've been doing public policy for a decade now and I was going to be the naysayer on on thrusting towards more public policy, but actually I think I'm convinced that you've got to keep the pressure on uh, and, and educate the next generation of folks to keep the pressure on policymakers to infiltrate places like uh, ONCD and NSC to make sure the people that have uh, uh, received the gospel uh, continue to move the ball forward. But the piece that I wanted to advocate for here is uh, the first point you made in terms of your three options, which was to uh, focus on time sensitive latency sensitive systems across the hinterland in this in the cyber in the uh, target rich cyber poor environment places uh, you know rural cooperatives electricity uh, small hospitals there's parts of the country where they're just not capable of getting the job done but we have people everywhere. You've got universities cranking out people with computer science and, and cybersecurity degrees. We've got uh, people with, you know, like, like ISC squared with, with folks that have certifications that do have some expectations for public uh, mm -hmm. service uh, built in. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got uh, in, in all these places, you've got congressional offices, you've got uh, FBI and Secret Service folks, you've got uh, state, you know, National Guard units. All the ingredients are all over the country to team up to engage in those areas where there's a gap. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's worthwhile talking about the big and lofty and moving things ahead that solve ecosystem risk issues like, like that happened with the Patch Act and with some of the stuff from the National Cyber Strategy. But someone's gotta be on the ground doing the work. Uh, and uh, and you know, notwithstanding the liability issue, which I think maybe you can put that on the public policy list of mm -hmm. can we have kind of the um, uh, a good Samaritan exception to make sure that the folks that are engaging in that way, providing advice uh, or even providing services can get some sort of uh, 
uh, liability protection. I think that, that you could create a nationwide movement of folks that not only are thinking in the big way and maybe attending the, the boot camp and getting more educated on what you just described, uh, but that are committed to public service and will actually go on the ground and help to make sure that that rural school or that rural hospital or that water utility that serves 100 people uh, is secure. And the playbook on how to do that can be generated and promulgated across the countryside. So I think that there's room for both the policy side and the operational side, but I agree it needs to be quite focused and it's a lot to wrangle. So I don't know the full solution. Don't leave yet. Thank you for that. Um, the one thing I held back, but I'm not going to because you said it, is one of our good friends from the ONCD, Rob Kanaki, said cyber has got to stop being a philanthropy. It's not being what? A philanthropy. Like, we're not going to scale it as long as it falls to volunteers and goodwill and someone choosing. I'm not sure he's right or not, but it rang true to me. Mm -hmm. um, and a fear I have always had is I Am the Cavalry was supposed to be a personal commitment from anyone who felt called to the mission. And, and while we love it when someone says, I love what you and Bo and Jan are doing, or I love what you've done, or you guys are great, thank you for saying that when you do. Uh, we want you to participate. Right, so we get scale from the number many hands make for light work. That said, Eli Sugarman once told us there are things that the private sector, the public sector can't do, but the private sector won't do. And for those things, it falls to philanthropy and altruism and things like I am the cavalry. And I always loved that. Uh, I loved it less over the last 10 years, not just because it's exhausting and sac I have scars to prove it. Uh, it's because at what point did we identify an unhandled exception and bring it to someone who can properly own it? And at what point do we become a crutch? Mm -hmm. And whatever we do next, we would need to have a social contract or an operating model where this is what we will do, within which extent, for how long, with the purpose toward getting it a home. And since you've been in the highest power quarters of power in the White House and cyber, do you have any, other than acknowledging, yes, what you just said is a problem, uh, do you have an instinct as to how we could be the, the trampoline, but not the hammock? You know, can we, can we help make sure things don't fall on the floor, but don't own it? And I don't mean we, Josh, I mean, mm -hmm. we, the coalition of the volunteers. Yeah, I think so. somehow the model needs to be, for instance, if, if, if this volunteer corps shows up in some place in rural Minnesota and, and helps a, a co-op get up and running, that that needs to be then kind of a, a surge to right as opposed to that that will continue forever. That, that uh, um, I, I don't know how exactly you get there, but uh, that needs to be the expectation. And then there can be some, and also a piece of that on the reactive side. In a national emergency, having these groups of people that know each other and are effective and they know the owners and operators in their area, you know, that's, that, that's a capability that could be engaged. Um, but, but I totally agree with you. This should not become a hammock. Yeah. I don't know. I have to ponder that more. Yeah. You, you might have some insight. You run one. Yeah. I, well, I, I Thank you, Steve. So I'm, my name is Ray Davidson. I, well, until recently ran the Michigan Cyber Civilian Corps. But we, we did some of the, we addressed some of the issues that you talked about. We got some people working together and uh, established some rules for how they work together. The, the thing that I see though is that the problem is so deep and wide. I mean, the, the approach that Josh has taken is like, it, we have to think of this as uh, not that the problem is too big, but the opportunities are vast. I mean, yeah. whatever you yeah. want to work on, whatever floats your boat, you know, there's, there's other people probably who are just not standing up to the microphone. They're sitting out there in the audience. So if you stand up to the microphone, they'll, they'll follow along. They'll do it, you know, you drop, drop a little thought in front of it. We're all the squirrel, right? So you drop the little thought, you're gonna have people following you. And that, that is how it works in Michigan. We got a bunch of people together, people that came like to Black Hat and DEF CON and they would go home or they would go to DerbyCon. Uh, which was closer for us, and they come home and they, they were like, we, last week we were hacking. We're bored this week, what are we gonna do? And we'd get together and we'd figure out you know, what was fun, 
and we were all white hat. You know, we didn't want to be na naughty or anything. We wanted to help our neighbors. And I live in a small town, Kalamazoo, Michigan. You know, it's it's a really nice. Not, it's not a small town. I grew up in Jason Aldean's small town, so it's not that kind of small town. But anyway, we all like each other. You know, we're all neighborhood. We're like Mr. Rogers. So there's people out there that will do it. But I trying to organize it in a top-down fashion where you have a regulatory group that's going to cover all community cyber defense, you know, it ain't, it ain't going to work. Uh, it, it's got to be top-down and bottom-up. And then one of the things that I'm excited about is the uh, Center for Long-Term Security, uh, Cybersecurity, and um, Craig Newmark has funded uh, uh, cyber, cyber civil defense initiatives, and I know Google just gave some money for the creation of uh, cyber clinics, cybersecurity clinics. And uh, UNLV has one where their computer science students go out and help, as I understand it, local governments and small and medium businesses who can't afford cybersecurity resources. Yeah. So there are solutions coming. Sorry to steal, but. So um, I like the affirmative phrasing. Uh, look at all the opportunity space, right? Um, an embarrassment of riches of things to go fix. Uh, and we tend to get excited. What was the phrase you used, Adi, this morning? Like, with the, with the kids that grew up saying, who were really, really into dinosaurs and the... Trains. And trains, okay. Happy to talk to others. Yes. Um, so we have a lot of passion. We have a lot of skill. Um, I'm so grateful that this B-Sides community has a heart of a servant or the desire to do something bigger than themselves, put things into the world instead of just be live within it. And uh, you can see these are hard trade-offs and hard choices, but... Um, uh, I, just some of you know this on a personal level, um, I ended my uh, private sector employment last Friday. I intend to just have you find me quietly, uh, overtly. I want to talk to some other think tanks. I want to talk to some academic institutions. I want to talk to some current and former govies and really wrestle through based on who reveals themselves to want to go fo solve some problems. And sometimes the work is chosen by the, by the volunteers. So I'm um, going to be open to possibility space. And one thing that's for sure uh, in the last 10 years, not just the mission, but like we've had what we went into the Atlantic Council, put my the private sector on hold, you know, the uh, nonprofit think tank for a bit. You went into the FDA for a bit. I had a awful blindside divorce for a bit. I had some surgery. Um, we went into emergency federal service. But most of that last 10 years has been having a full-time day job and a full-time volunteer job. And I feel like these problems are big enough that I would like to, at least for myself, have one unified mission. So I'm gonna at least give the next one, three months to answer that. That's on me, not your responsibilities, but some of you seem like you've heard the call a little bit and we should talk about it. Um, so. If you haven't had bourbon yet, or if you had some and you liked it, and you're 21 years old, um, or whatever the, the law is here, uh, please come have a little toast. And um, thank you for your time. Thank you for your contributions over the last decade. I had no idea if any of this would work, but look at what we were able to accomplish together. Cheers. Cheers.